We've been told from scripture that man cannot live by bread or donuts alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so I'm going to ask you if you have a copy of God's word this morning, uh, Bible, or on your phone, whatever it may be, to open to the book of Esther. All right. Now, let's leave this title slide up here just for a second, Kara. There are certain phrases out of the scriptures that people will use uh, for various things, you know. Uh, and so as I come, this statement that we're using for such a time as this is found in Esther chapter 4. Uh, it is a quote that we're going to focus on this morning, but we have some build up to get there. And I just want to own before we begin, in this room, there is nobody exactly like you. All right? You, and some of you are like, whoo, that is good. Other people are like, there should be more of me. The world would be a better place. But what I know is this. God has been building from day one of your life, actually even long prior to that, building into you work that he has for his glory. So where you at where you're at at the beginning of 2023 is not happenstance. You are the product of what God's been building into you from eternity past. And I just want to own that today that God has built you for something today that he says, "Hey, I have great things in store for you, but it may take you some paths that you were not prepared to go." And so as we think about that, let's pray and then dive into Esther as we consider all the things we've been talking about at our tables this morning. God, thank you this morning for a new year. Thank you this morning, God, that you have said uh, to each and every one who's uh, shown up this morning, hey, get up and go to church. For some, this was just easy. Others are like sleeping through right now. And, uh, and sugar doesn't help them. But God, I do pray that you'd intervene this morning and just uh, as we spend time together around your word, bring life change. Let this morning not come and go as simply, hey, I did church this morning and uh, we, we endured it and made it through so we can go to lunch. But that we actually stop and visit with you and say, God, what do you have for me this year? What have you built me for, for the year 2023? As we consider those things, God, I pray that you would just uh, bless my mouth, may it speak well, bless my mind, may it think well, and I pray you bless the ears that are hearing, that they would listen and receive what you have for them this morning. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, you were built for this. Before uh, I get there, I just want to remind you of something. Paul, in a, the book of Ephesians, declares this. For those who know Christ... For those who know Christ, for we are God's handiwork. This is Ephesians 2.10. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So this morning I just want you to know, you were built for something for God's kingdom advancement. You were built to do something. And it wasn't uh, because of who you are, but you were created in Christ Jesus to do this good works, these good works. And I love this, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God has been preparing for 2023 for a very long time. You know what? Some of us always like reflect back on just 2022, like what went good, what went bad. God's like, dude, I have been preparing this for eternity. What's been good, what's been bad, I'm using it all. I'm using it all. And as we start, I just want to uh, land on a quote from Warren Wearsby. And I, uh, uh, I, I think here we go. So if Warren Wearsby, uh, a great theologian, he pastored Moody Bible Church uh, in Chicago for a long time. Super great writer. He wrote a series series of commentaries called the B series. What are you called the B as you follow Jesus? Uh, but he shares this quote of a guy that he actually heard from, Dr. Augustus Hopkins Strong. How about that for a solid name, Dr. Augustus? And he wrote in his book, Systematic Theology, this statement, and I, and I think here we go. Providence is God's attention concentrated everywhere. Have you ever talked with someone, myself being probably one of them, who you feel like, hey, his mind is somewhere else? Yeah, yeah. You're like talking and you're like, hey, I know you're not tracking with me. I know you're not listening to me. And some of us are like, I'm just so many steps ahead of you. Uh, I'm already thinking of the solution to the question that you've asked. And so you're, you get that feeling like, hey, you're not concentrating on what I am. I struggle to do that with myself. 
Can you imagine God working on seven billion people this morning in a world that he's like, you have my full attention, every single one of you. And I have been working on your case from eternity past to bring glory to my name. God's providence. I had a man uh, named Doug Bookman who talked years ago. He said, hey, would you rather think it's amazing to see miracles or providence? Because miracles are these one-hit wonders. Like when Jesus uh, turned water into wine, that was like, bam, that was awesome. Or when Moses uh, holds out his staff and the Red Sea parts, he's like, that's awesome. But you know what's really incredible? It's how God can orchestrate a thread all through history that is unbroken that gets us to where we are today. To say, hey, I knew all of it. I orchestrated all that. And here's a sweet reality. God does not orchestrate sin. But he can allow for sin even in our lives to say, I use that for your glory, for your good. And, he's, and I don't know how God does all that because he is God and I am not. But he is a master planner. So as we start this new year, just own the fact that you are here by divine design. You were built for this. And as we consider this, we're going to look at this book of Esther and we're going to talk through the same things that I talked, or that you talked at your tables. So the very first thing, and Kara, I don't even remember how I put these slides. What's, what's the next? All right. Get to know the cast of the story. So today you started getting to know the people at your table. All right? You, we use donuts and frosting and all these things to get to know one another. I want to just quickly lay out for you four key players in the book of Esther. We're not going to uh, delve deep into who all they are. Uh, the book is named Esther after Esther. All right? She is the primary player in this game. All right? And we're going to talk about her life. But then she has a relative named Mordecai, a godly man who is going to change challenge her to do what God has for her. And I and, and we'll get there, but I don't like when people push me. When people push me, I usually resist. And we'll see how Esther responds to Mordecai's push for what God has for her. Then there's a guy named Xerxes. He's the king, all right? King Xerxes. And as he plays in this game, he is the king of that uh, nation, but he really plays a very minor role in the story with one caveat. Nothing happens unless he approves it. And so he plays a significant role, but actually a minor role. So it's, he's kind of a two-for-one special. And then we get Haman. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Haman is the evil man who hates the Jews. There is a storyline that if, if you track it back, that Haman's great-great-great-great-great-grandfather or whatever, an agite, was killed by the Jews, and it seems like he's been brooding on this for years, and he hates Mordecai. And actually, Mordecai doesn't really like him either. There's some bad mojo there. And, like, Haman wants Mordecai to honor him, and Mordecai's like, dude, you're a chump. I don't need to do anything for you. And uh, so I don't know if you've ever experienced those things, uh, but there's some tension in the land. And so as we consider getting to know the cast, we have Esther, Mordecai, Xerxes, and Haman. All right? So those are the people that we're going to see play out. So as we get to know each other at our tables, get to know that crew. Now, check, the next point is this. We should have a significant life change. I don't know what you guys talked about. Some of you, again, we threw out some options, moves, uh, deaths of loved ones, different things like this. Esther's life changes were these. She was growing up doing great in her own little world. King Xerxes has a falling out with his queen. She is kind of uh, less than respectful. And his, uh, all the king's advisors say, like, dump her. So he dumps Queen Vashti and then goes on the hunt. And kind of in a Middle Eastern bachelor episode, he is looking for a new bride. All right? And so the kingdom goes through. Esther gets chosen. Not, it's, it's not like she applied for the job. She gets picked to say, you're going into the pool to see if you can be the next queen. Not her choice, but place there. Life change. Sometimes that happens to us. When things that go on in our lives, they're not our choosing. But then she goes through this whole process of preparing for that uh, interview uh, with the king, and he likes her more than anyone else, and so she becomes queen. Life change. And Mordecai says, hey, don't tell anyone you're a Jew. Just do your thing, be the queen, but don't tell anyone you're a Jew. 
So as we go through this, there's all kinds of life change that Esther gets just along as, uh, as we have. But then we come to the point of significant challenge. So, again, go back to the story of Mordecai and Haman. They don't like each other. Haman gets the ear of the king and says, Hey, would you allow me the opportunity to extinguish, to annihilate, to cut off from existence a group of people? And the king, remember Xerxes, he is a minor player but has significant power in this. He's like, sure. I will grant you that opportunity. And so Haman says, I hate Mordecai, so I'm going to wipe out Mordecai and all of the Jews. Yeah. Running in the background is Queen Esther, who is a Jew, in the harem of the king. But the king doesn't know Esther's a Jew. So all this is playing on, and as we come together, we meet this point of significant challenge, and that's where we're going to dive into God's word today, is to say this. Now Mordecai says, Esther, you were built for something. This event that took place in your world didn't just happen to you. It was happening by God's design. And as we consider what goes on in Esther's world, let us apply it to our world. And so what we see here, very first thing that I want to focus on, this significant challenge, is there's an honest presentation of the situation. You ever talk to people who kind of hedge what they're trying to tell you? Like there's something significant they want to tell you, but they're kind of like, hey, I'm going to go the long way around to get to this. And you're like, just tell me what you want. Mordecai is a straight shooter. He is in grief, he is in mourning, but he does not get to enter the king's palace. He cannot enter the king's palace. He is wearing sackcloth, and that is not allowed in that zone. That, as I was reading this week, the king's palace was supposed to be this kind of pristine place where there's no troubles. So Mordecai does not get to go in, so there becomes a middleman. If ever you found yourself as a middleman, it is an uncomfortable place. You're trying to convey someone's thoughts and intentions to someone else and then going back and forth, and you're like, man, just cut me out of the deal. But there's this individual named Hethik. All right? For those who are having children this year, there's a baby name for you. But in Esther chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, it says, So Hethik went out to Mordecai, because Esther's like, what's going on? Why is he so grieved? Went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in the front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. So Haman not only says, hey, would you allow me this, but I'll pay you, king, if you let me do this. He's an evil man. He also gave a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which was published in Susa, to show the Esther and explain it to her. And he told her to instruct her. Now here's this. This is where the challenge comes. So Mordecai says, hey, we have a death sentence. It has been decreed throughout the kingdom to kill the Jews. And now Mordecai says, hey, Hacketh, or Hathak, Go tell Esther, instruct her to go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and to plead with him for her people. He says, hey, this is what's going on. I need you to do this. This is where I bristle. This is where I'm like, don't tell me what to do. I, that's your thing, that's not my thing. But Mordecai is like, hey, this is what is needed here. This is what he is. So Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai said. All right? So here's a personal, this is an honest evaluation of the situation. This is what's going on. Esther hears this, and this is what I want to come to next. Remember when I'm like, how do you respond? How do you respond when you're challenged? This is Esther's response, and I kind of understand where she's coming from. So it says this in verse 10, she instructed him. Again, there's this back and forth. This is like the game of telephone, back and forth with this guy named Hathak. So she instructed him, Hathak, to go say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal province know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law. 
that they must be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. This is a life and death moment, all right? So this is not just like, ah, oh, I just don't really feel like that. It's not my thing today. She's saying, hey, just so you know, you're already aware of this. If I go into the king's presence, it doesn't matter that I'm the queen. If I go in and he does not hold out the golden scepter to me, I am dead. So you're telling me to go do something that I feel uncomfortable to do, and I just don't think that this is what I really uh, believe is the best move right now. I'm going to give you my personal response. How often do we act that way? In my head, this is how it should play. Mordecai has a plan. Esther has a plan. And he sa so she says this. So Hackett, Hathak went back and reported, uh, what, let's see, uh, about 30 days, hang on, get my notes straight. So she says, hey, you know the, the rules, and I haven't even been invited into the king's court for 30 days. She's like, I am the queen, he likes me more than all the other ladies, and I haven't even seen him for a month. And so you want me to go do something that's a death sentence to, to act on this? And here's what I want to hear today for you and I. I don't know what God's been building into your world. I don't know what challenges he's placed before you. I don't know what uh, life events he's done in your world. All these things are building for something that he has you to do. And Mordecai is going to lay it out before her very plainly. And I just want to encourage you this morning. If you don't have Mordecai's in your life, people who will talk straight to you for what God wants, make that a New Year's resolution. Get people into your world who love Jesus and love you. And they love Jesus more than you, so they'll tell you what you need to hear. Mordecai, again, playing this middleman through Hathak, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this response. Here's a pointed reply. All right, so we've got all these things building and what's going on, and he says this. This is what you need to hear, Esther. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. He says, hey, the death sentence goes for all of us, you included. Don't think because you're the queen that you're going to get out of this. And Mordecai is pretty, he's pretty edgy here. Don't think that because you, you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. And then he drops this gauntlet on her. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. He's like, you know what? T technically, God doesn't need you to do this. But he will bring deliverance for his people. But you and your families, but you and your father's family will perish. Heavy. And then here is the zone that I want us to fixate on. And who knows? but that you have come to the royal position for such a time as this. He's like, hey, Esther, God has something in store for you that he's been orchestrating. Do you realize that you grew up at the time you did? Do you realize that the queen got banished for the time when she did so that you could be placed into the court that way? You got chosen because God has something special for you. And now God says, it's time to act because I built you for this. And you're hedging on that. You're like, I don't know. And so let me ask you this morning, what has God been building you to do? All your life has been built for his glory. He has been putting places and things and sufferings and blessings, all these things into your world to say, I've got things in store for you. Now go do. And the sweet truth is we only know this moment for Esther. We don't know the rest of her days. I don't know how many days you have left. I don't know how many days I have left. But what I know is this. God's been building me for something for today. And I, what I get in today, I get to use for tomorrow. And so God is continually building me for things for his glory. And so as we start 2023, what have you been built for? What have you been built for? Some of you have been built for longer days than I've been alive. But God's not done. Some of you are younger. We have some kiddos in this class, or this room this morning. God's not saying, well, you're too young to do what I have for you. No, everything is building for such a time as this. Mordecai says, Esther, you were built for this. Church, 
We were built for this. Who knows what 2023 has? There could be a mass recession that continues to go on. We were built for this. There could be war all throughout the world. We were built for this. For such a time as this. Sometimes you're like, oh man, I wish I would live back in the, you know, the 1600s when the Puritans were all about Jesus, things like that. You know what? You weren't built for that. You were built for today. January 1, 2023. God says, I have you there for a purpose. What were you built for? His glory. So as Mordecai drops the gauntlet on Esther through Hecate, her heart's challenged. And she says, okay. And here, look at this. There's an honest prayer request. Bill Wolf uh, has been really pressing this upon our men on uh, Monday nights as we've been doing discipleship training. Nothing happens without prayer. So if you're like, I have no idea what I'm built for, ask God. Say, God, I have no clue what you have for me this year. Ask God. Esther knows what she was built for. She knows what the challenge. She pushed back, but he, Mordecai pushed back harder. And God says, okay. Look what we see with Esther. Then Esther went, uh, sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Go without food on my behalf. Now, I want, I want you to hear something really quick before I go further. It wasn't simply going without food. Wearsby, Warren Wearsby again says, even though the name of God is not mentioned in the text, which Esther's a weird book, God's name is never mentioned. The act of this of humiliation was obviously directed to the Lord and was certainly accompanied by prayer. When she says, gather the Jews and fast, she wasn't just saying, hey, go without food to be like sad. She says, go fast, humble yourselves before God and pray for me. Pray for me. And so as we consider that, what does God build you for? Ask him. And maybe you need to say, you know what? Maybe I need to go without some food for today to say, God, I'm really serious about what you want from me. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just gave us donuts. You're welcome. I don't know what God has for the rest of your day. <laughs> but when this is done, I love this. She says, I will drop the mic now on you. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And I hear this. <laughs> this is solid play by Esther. If I perish, I perish. I will do what I'm called to do. If I die, I die. When Mordecai, and then Mordecai went away and carried out Esther's instructions. He's going to gather the team to pray for Esther. And so as she says, hey, please pray for me. Some of us pray and hope that's the end. You know, someone's like, I'll pray, and but please, God, don't direct me anywhere else. But Esther prays, and she says, hey, I will go. And catch this. I love where we go now. There's an honest, personal response. She says, after three days, I'll go. Esther 5, verse 1 says, on the third day, true to her word, she put on her royal robes and stood in the inner courts of the palace. Can you imagine her? There's like, you know, like... All right. Here we go. I may die, but I'm going in. Stands in the inner court in front of the palace, in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on the royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. This is the point of decision. What's going to happen? She's willing to do what God says, even if it means death. When, the, when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, dun, 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 he was pleased with her and how did, held out his gold scepter in his hand. Woo! Life given. But now what? Now, so Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, I'll give it to you. And she says this, If it please the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman, dun, 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 come today to a banquet I prepared for him. And so as you read through Esther, she is willing to obey. She's willing to do. She's willing to go say, God, you built me for this. But then she goes and says, hey, now let me pull the trigger on what the plan is. So she says, can you guys come to a banquet that I've prepared? And as you read through Esther, like five, six, seven, Haman thinks he's the greatest guy in town. He's like, dude, the king wants to bring me to a party with his bride. I love this. I must be really amazing. And he's, and, and as he's doing this, he's like, but I really hate that Mordecai dude. And, uh, and his wife says, hey, you know what you should do? You should set up a, like, gallows to hang him in our backyard. 
You should make that as our yard, our yard ornaments. Some people have bird houses, some people have like bird baths, some people have a gallo. You never know. <laughs> so as this goes, Haman comes, and then we see in verse seven or chapter seven of Esther. So after a series of banquets, so the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and they were drinking wine on the second day, and the king asked her again. Queen Esther, what is your petition? What, this can't be all it is. It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, and it will be granted. Here is where she steps in and says, this is what I was built for. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. Spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. And if it were, it, I love her heart here. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet. She's like, hey, if it was just slavery, which we're like, wait a second. But hey, slavery or death, two big differences here. And so it says this, if it was just simply slavery, I wouldn't have said a thing. Because no such or such was likely justified to serve the king. And King Xerxes asked, Queen Esther, who is this? Where is he, the man who has dared to do such a thing? You ever have an awkward moment? This is it. Esther said, an adversary and an enemy. This vile Haman. Haman goes from hero to zero in one fail swoop. And he was terrified before the queen, king and queen. And the king got up in rage. And he left his wine. That's how mad he was. <laughs> He's like, I can't even take that. He left his wine and went out of the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind and begged Esther for his life. And, and, and again, awkward to more awkward. But just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king exclaimed, will you even molest the queen while she's with me in the house? She's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and as soon as the words left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. This is like one of those things like when you see in like the movies when like the black bag is thrown over somebody's head. That's this and and then this I don't know how this plays into the shepherd's heart of a pastor but I do get a kick out of this point so as this is all transpiring I believe God just puts things together in an amazing way and there's this guy named Harbona, one of the eunuchs standing at the king. He says, you know what? There's a pole reaching to the height of about 50 cubits that stands in Haman's house, some new yard ornaments. He had it set up for Mordecai, uh, who spoke up to help the queen. And the king says, huh, impale him on that. So they impaled Haman on the pole and said that he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's fury subsided. <laughs> what a day! What a day! So as we play through that, just so you know, you can read through the rest of Esther and see how God spares uh, the nation of Israel that day. But all this comes around to this. Esther was built for a moment that God says, I have been orchestrating your life for this. What is God orchestrating your life to do? You're not here by chance. You're not, your, your life, those circumstances, you're like, man, that was weird. God's like, yeah, I did that. I did that. And so today, I'm going to ask as we go to table time, for you just to ask this question. And this may really push some of you. All right? This will really push some of you. But maybe at your table, one of you says, hey, this is what I believe God has put me for, together for, for 2023. How do I advance his kingdom? I'm not concerned if you're looking to lose weight in 2023. Great. I'm not concerned if you're going to watch less TV in 2023. Maybe you're going to watch more TV. I don't know what your plan is. But what has God built you for this year to advance his kingdom. What has he built you for? So hey, you want to be better at something, great. But bigger picture, advance in the kingdom. Take a minute to talk at your table. Maybe some of you, I have no clue. We'll pray for you at the end. Because I am in the same boat. I'm like, God, I don't know what you have for me. But I do know this. You do. But maybe some of you do. Say, I know what God has for me. Because I have two young ladies that I'm going to have share in just a minute. That they know what God has in store for them, and they're going to come share. So talk amongst yourselves, and I'm going to uh, call up uh, some special guests to close out our time together. So talk amongst yourselves. What does God have in store for you to advance his kingdom in 2023? All right.
right. I know, I know those table time discussions are way too big for the few minutes I give you, and I just want to recognize this. Church doesn't have to stop at 11, because I do. You guys can go to lunch together, just so you know restaurants are open today, and you can do life together, and do Jesus work together, and I have two young ladies uh, who God has said, hey, I have something special for you this year, and uh, these two are going to be going on separate uh, trips to serve God around the world, and uh, they're going to share, and if maybe some of you in this room are like, you know what, I've been really feeling like God's going to put on my heart to uh, just write a check and say, send it, you guys go, don't worry about it. Oh, hey. <laughs> just so you know, I wasn't saying that. I'm just saying yeah. Hey, I, I don't want to share all. I don't want to steal all the blessing. So, but I'm going to have Maddie Gulliver share, and she's going to share about her trip going on. Then she's going to pass the mic to Haley, and uh, and then when they're done, we're just going to wrap up the day together. So, uh, Maddie, take us away. So God has laid in my heart a couple different things. Um, this isn't my mission trip, but May 15th, I'm heading to Kentucky to serve in a ministry that our youth group actually went to, on a trip to. And I'm going to be there until July 9th, just working as a leader. But um, if you would like to support me on this mission trip, I'm going to Brazil. It will be July something to like August 5th. I don't know the exact dates, but I'll be going with about 10 people that's led by Jay Mead, who used to go here. Um, it's similar to the one that he and Brayden Marvel went on about four years ago, but it's gonna be with more people. When we are there in Brazil, we will do whatever the people need us to do, which include building, tearing down things, but most importantly, we'll be telling them about Jesus. And when I heard the stories for the first time, when Jay and Brayden went to Brazil, I knew I wanted to do the same thing and go serve him the same way. The trip all together will cost me about $2,000, and wait, $2,200, because I also need to buy a passport. <laughs> Those are expensive. But if you would like to support me, just shoot me a text or a call or even prayers would be even more appreciated because this is a scary thing for me as I've never been out of the country and this summer I'm taking chances and going blindly wherever God calls me and being away from home I've never been away from home for two months and I've also never been out of the country so it's some new things but I'm also excited so if you'd like to talk to me about it I'd love to tell you more about it Thank you, Maddie. Hello, I am Haley Lucarelli. I am also going to Brazil. Um, separate trip, separate group, separate everything. Um, I had this amazing opportunity to go to Alaska over the summer, and then I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to kind of stick with the missions, and I don't know, it was such a eye-opening reality of going down there and up there, over there. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. It was great. Um, but I'm going in March, and I'm going with this, my small group, 1829 through Magnify in Rockford. Um, they put this missions trip on with Dan Cook. We will be putting on and running a weekend retreat for local Brazilian students at Camp Paradise. Practicing English with a native speaker is highly valued there, so we have this unique opportunity to share the gospel through the means of English conversations and exposure. Um, we have the opportunity to partner with local churches and further engage with young adults in the community. I am extremely excited for this, just the whole going out of the country and being a big girl and getting a passport, it's, it's very new, but it's very exciting. This trip also costs about $2,000, and I'm taking donations and pop cans um, to help with expenses. Um, I would greatly appreciate anything. I would also, that your investment would also not only help me, but also be an extension in God's work to another part of the world. I also need people to pray for me prior to the trip, during the trip, and the mindset to share and teach the gospel for not just me, but also, I think I'm going with 17 other people, and just running a camp for kids our age, like, 
it's hard running camp for younger kids, but now adults, that's a whole new level. Um, for our safety and our hearts as we prepare, and safety traveling, wisdom as we craft the weekend retreat, and that our hearts will, our hearts will be softened as we open to God's gift of salvation and opening the hearts to these, not teenagers, not kids, but young adults and just, we're natives over there and some of them not, might not like that, but others are like super pumped and so just pray for me and Maddie to hopefully the costs will be praised and just prayer, safe, safety, travels. Yeah, my mom gets really scared so hey let's let's just own this these two are responding to a call that says hey god built you for this through various groups of people that you've interacted with, ministries you've been part of, uh, families you've grown in, all those pieces come together for this moment, which again is not the culminating moment of their life. It's pieces to build for the next stage. And we get to be part of that. And so I don't know in this room again, maybe you're like, hey, I've got some pop cans I can donate. That's going to take a lot of pop cans. But here's what I do know is this. God is a great God. He has orchestrated something. He will provide that. And we're going to just ask God to bless these two. And as we're going to get ready to do this, we're going to pray our way out, uh, praying over them. What I need you guys to hear this morning, too, I don't know what God has for you. But just as Mordecai said, hey, you know what? If you don't step in and do what God's ability to do, don't worry. He will still accomplish it. You don't have to worry about God not able to accomplish because you didn't. But man, why lose the joy, the blessing that God has for us to be part of what he's doing? Because that is the abundant life. That is what we are built for. That is what we seek to do. Ladies, I'm excited for what God has in store for you. We're going to have them back to share up uh, after they get back how it went and uh, things like this. So that'll be exciting to hear those things. Uh, but as we go forward today... What does God have in store for you? And it may mean eating the rest of these donuts because they need to go somewhere, all right? And not to the trash. So, all right, let me just pray over these ladies, pray over you guys, and then we will uh, make our way out. Happy New Year to you. I pray that God does great, great things through you because he's going to do them anyways. So we might as well be part of the team. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are never overwhelmed, you are never underfunded, you are never challenged with something you don't know what to do with. Actually, I don't think you're challenged ever at all. But you love to challenge your people and say, do you trust me? Do you trust me? I built you for this. Lord, thank you for Maddie. Thank you for Haley. Thank you for their families that are stepping forward in faith to say, hey, we want to go and do this. There are big world things like getting passports and leaving the country and all these things. But God, people throughout the ages have done this. And so there's a great cloud of witnesses that says this is a doable thing. But it's only doable because of you, Jesus. And so this year, I pray that it would be a blessing for Maddie and Haley to see those provisions, those finances just completely given by your hand. Maybe something that they can say, only God can do this. And God, if that's part of what we get to be invested in, great. But Lord, finances aside, we pray that your name would be lifted high in their lives, through their lives, and to those people that they'll serve. And I pray, God, today that you'd really work in the hearts and lives of each individual in this classroom, from young to old, and everywhere in between. God, you have not put us here for no purpose. You put us here to be your masterpieces, your handiwork, to advance your kingdom and bring glory to you. And in doing all that, God, you says you're going to enjoy life beyond your wildest dreams. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be awesome. And so, Lord God, we just embrace that. We trust you in that. And when we waver in that, help our unbelief. And I ask that you'd bless all of us as we head out into this first day of the new year. May you be praised. May, may our lives be blessed. And may the world be changed because of how awesome you are. It's in the name of Jesus. Amen.